Okay, this is Professor Cahan Lust. This is History 1301, U.S. History 2, 1877. And this is whew, Lecture 19, The Civil War Ends and Reconstruction. So we are at the end of the semester. Now, in the last class, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, as you should uh, recall, uh, freed slaves in areas that were under Confederate control. Uh, this immediately freed only a very small number of people. Uh, it was a very tiny fraction uh, of the enslaved in the United States. Uh, however, a bigger issue is that the Emancipation Proclamation would eventually free about 4 million enslaved people in the United States, and it immediately turned the United States' Civil War into a war to abolish slavery. But it also freed up tens of thousands of African-American men to serve in the United States Armed Forces. African-Americans played a crucial role in Union victory. About 220,000 African-Americans served in the Union Army, approximately 10% of the entire total of the Union Army. Without them, Union victory was highly unlikely. So this was a really key part of the American force in the Civil War. But black soldiers fought two separate battles over the course of this war. Uh, one was against the Confederacy, and one was for equality in the, in the Union Army. African-American soldiers uh, fought in segregated units under white commanders and received unequal pay. For example, white privates in the United States Army earned $16 a month plus a stipend for their uniform, Black soldiers received $10 a month and paid for their own uniforms, again, out of a stipend. Uh, so they were initially underpaid uh, compared to white soldiers. Uh, and they voiced their displeasure about this. Black soldiers voiced their displeasure about this. On top of this, African Americans were initially uh, assigned to labor and construction battalions, uh, which made a lot of them angry because they were very keenly interested in actually fighting. Uh, for their freedom. Uh, not until nearly the end of the war in 1864 did African Americans regularly serve in combat battalions uh, or get promotion into the officer corps. But service in the United States military was incredibly empowering, as we can see from this picture that you see uh, on the board here, or on the screen here. Uh, for uh, many African Americans, uh, they learned how to read as a, as a result of their military service. There was an understanding by the War Department that if we were going to bring these men in to the armed forces and have them serve, well, they needed to be able to read orders. They needed to be able to follow a specific set of directions uh, the way the military laid them out. So literacy was an absolute necessity. So the War Department set up schools for these, uh, for these new soldiers to teach them literacy. Uh, it also gave many African Americans their first experience with real political organization, not with politics, because obviously opposing slavery was a political decision, but their first experience with political organization, especially over the issue of pay. By the time the end of the war, uh, the War Department uh, wound up implementing equal pay requirements uh, within the United States Army. Now, this may sound like a minor victory, but it's important. It's the first law in the United States' history based on an always stated concept in American society, the idea of equal rights. Now, look at this young man on the board or on the screen, and I want you to think about what he looks like on the left when he's literally appearing before the Union Army in rags and what uh, his demeanor appears to be, and what must be running through his mind, as opposed to on the right-hand side, uh, which is not to say that he's particularly happy about being in the military, but you can see how much taller the kid stands, how much bigger he appears to be uh, as, a, as a person. Uh, he's got a very distinctly different bearing about himself. And Frederick Douglass actually talked about this uh, as far as how military service affected African Americans. Just listen to what he said, quote, once let the black man get upon his person the brass letters U.S., 
Let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket. There is no power on earth which can deny that he has earned the right to citizenship in the United States. Now, black soldiers were now part of the military establishment, but it's still going to take an awfully long time for many African Americans to prove that they could actually be equal in the eyes of white officers. Uh, they uh, proved their will to fight uh, at a battle called the Battle of Fort Wagner uh, in South Carolina. Fort Wagner was considered to be a virtually impregnable fortress, uh, and a group called the 54th Massachusetts Colored Regiment, as they were called, was essentially destroyed in this fight. Many of them died, and the reason so many died was because they were assaulting uh, essentially a position that was it was impossible to actually assault it. There was no way it was going to be successful. Everybody who sent these soldiers into this battle knew that they were going to die, but the soldiers themselves believed that their sacrifice, that by sacrificing themselves at that position, it would draw attention away from other parts of the military and would allow the Union Army to ultimately be successful at Fort Wagner. And that turned out to be accurate. So a lot of these men understood that they were sacrificing themselves. They were martyring themselves. And this convinced virtually everybody in the United States military establishment that black soldiers possessed the requisite courage, the requisite character uh, to actually be soldiers uh, as a courtesy as a courtesy of this battle. Now, if any of you think that this battle may sound familiar, uh, if you've watched the movie Glory that came out in the 1980s, that's in part the story uh, of this battle. So battles like Fort Wagner convinced Lincoln uh, that there was a uh, a new strategy was necessary. The Union Army suffered a tremendous amount of losses, but they won at Fort Wagner. So Lincoln is equally convinced of these young men's courage, but he's also convinced that something new has to be tried during the Civil War, and that something new is called the strategy of total war. And it's going to be the defining feature of the American way of war, as one historian put it. The Civil War, as I mentioned, is the first modern war in our history. It's a war where the distinction between the military and civilian erodes. It goes away. The, in, the, in total warfare, there's no difference when a military begins approaching an area. They don't look at things and say, that's a military target. That is what we are going to take. Oh, that is civilian, so we leave this alone. That doesn't exist. In total war, the idea is to destroy the enemy's will to fight. So an army or a nation, I should say, uses everything, every resource they have to go against the entirety of an enemy society. Okay, So that's why these uh, distinctions uh, disappear. Um, the generals that Lincoln appoints and allows his chief general, Ulysses S. Grant, to appoint uh, as his high command, are all men who are going to wind up adopting this strategy. Now, they don't call it, quote, total war. They understood what total war was because of their, uh, because of their, uh, of their schooling. But what they were referring to, to it as was the raiding strategy. The raiding strategy uh, is their basic idea. Uh, and William Tecumseh Sherman was probably the best at carrying out this so-called raiding strategy. Uh, they did everything that they could, guys like William Tecumseh Sherman, Ulysses S. Grant, Phil Sheridan, to destroy every part of Confederate society in an effort to say, you need to give up. They confiscated property, both enslaved people and anything that was considered usable by the military. So Sherman would go to farms and he would not only confiscate slaves, he'd confiscate their crops, he'd confiscate livestock, he'd confiscate silver, because he believed that people could either melt the silver down and use it for certain purposes, or they could sell the silver and use it to finance the war. He would go out and he would destroy farms, because he'd say, I've taken all of your food, 
but you might be able to grow more food and use that to feed Confederate soldiers. So everything is fair game here. They ripped up railroads as a way of saying, we're not going to allow you to not only use this to transport civilians and the like, we're not going to use it, let you use it to transport military goods or military servicemen. They burned down factories. They tore entire towns to bits in an effort to destroy the Confederacy's will to fight. So everybody is engaged. Now, to give you an idea of how Sherman pursued this, we're going to look at some pictures here in a second. And you can see just how badly uh, Southern society is attacked here. This is Atlanta, Georgia in 1864, a place where Sherman sent a letter to the leaders of the city and told them that he would teach, he would get them to learn that hell was what war was, that they would find hell preferable to what was going on in warfare. This is another image of Atlanta in 1864. This is Charleston, South Carolina. And if we pull back a little bit, we can see it even more devastated. This is, I believe it is Richmond, Virginia. or Char No, I'm sorry. That's also Charleston, South Carolina. This is Columbia, South Carolina. This is Richmond, Virginia. It looks almost like a World War II, II city that's been bombed out. Uh, you know, uh, the attacks over uh, Great Britain, uh, for example. Uh, this is also Richmond, Virginia. It literally looks bombed out because Sherman and his men or Grant and his men, Sheridan and his men would come through and just destroy everything. And this is the railroad terminus uh, at Richmond. So you can see it's just absolutely uh ripped apart and made unusable. Now, the United States also did things like standardized time zones during this era. Remember, the idea is utilize all parts of your society to destroy the enemy's will to fight. So standardized time zones so people can depend on what's, uh, on, uh, on what's coming and when. They standard, uh, standardized clothing sizes in order to allow factories to engage in a much greater sense of mass production of uniforms, as opposed to having everybody be tailored, have a, have a uniform that is tailored exactly to their specifications. You just create a number of uniforms that can be tailored on the fly that, you know, everybody gets a uniform. It's a small, medium or a large. And if we have to hem the pants, so be it. If we have to, uh, if we have to hem the sleeves or, uh, or something, we can, we can do it, but standard sizes uh, is going to be the area here. Why they're doing this is to promote disintegration, to bring the war home to people so that people in the Confederacy will send letters to their loved ones on the battlefield and say, look, we're being attacked at home. You can't be out there on the battlefield. You've got to come home to, quote, protect us. Lincoln had been convinced, remember, that society had been hijacked. The Confederacy didn't favor secession. But by 1863, excuse me, 1864, Lincoln is, is, has done a 180. He said, all right, no, the Confederacy, all of these people did want secession. So if they all wanted secession, they're all going to pay. It must be destroyed in order for us to have victory. Now, some other things are going to change. As I mentioned at the top of this in our last lecture, the Civil War... Uh, Congress enacts laws that forever alter society, and with the South out of the Union, it becomes possible to uh, enact the vision that Alexander Hamilton had for the United States all the way back in those early Republic years. So, for example, uh, Congress establishes a transcontinental railroad. It was something that Stephen Douglas was trying to to support, as you should recall when we talked about. Kansas and Nebraska. Well, now it's a reality during the Civil War. This is something that will allow the ent entire fabric of the United States to be linked from coast to coast, everything in between. This is something that Alexander Hamilton could have only dreamed of, but as a guy who favored a nation based on industry and movement of industrially produced goods, he absolutely would have been behind this. Lincoln is behind it because it not only links 
everybody together on this massive transportation grid. It's a symbol of union. Everybody has been united through this transportation grid. So Congress funds this massive public program to build a railroad from New York to California. Now, also, with with building that railroad in mind, Congress also understands there are not a lot of people living along the route from New, New, New York to California, especially once we get west of the Mississippi River. So in order to address that problem, to populate these areas so that the railroad has some place to stop and people to bring goods to, Congress passes the Homestead Act. It gives free land to any person who will move west and settle there for five years. More than 500,000 people will take the government up on this Homestead Act. Now, people had to go and settle in the west. They had to uh, improve the land that they got. They paid a token payment to the United States government, which could be refinanced over time and the like. Uh, Also, veterans qualified for free land and all of this stuff. All a person had to do in order to maintain the land, to maintain ownership, was improve the land. And improvement, just like when we talked about it earlier in the semester, the bar for improvement is a very low bar. If you sink a well, you've improved the land. If you put up a fence, you've improved the land. If you put a house up, you've improved the land. If you put crops in, you've improved the land. So that's all somebody has to do to qualify for all of these potential benefits under the Homestead Act. Now, while 500,000 people take advantage of it, I don't want to give you the wrong impression, two-thirds of them actually fail. But the point is, is that it populates the area. Those 500,000 people, the two-thirds that fail, don't just go, well, That's it. I guess pack up and go back east. They pick up and go, all right, let's try it again. And they're allowed to qualify and fail and qualify again and fail again. So this does actually do what it's supposed to do. It populates the American West. Congress also sets up land grant colleges to create a workforce that's capable of functioning in an industrial revolution. These land-grant colleges are dedicated to agricultural science. Now, what that means is, is taking scientific principles to make science, to make agriculture even more productive. So instead of using old-time farming techniques, instead of using old plowing techniques, this is going to, imp- this is going to uh, do things like have people studying how to change crops to make those crops more productive. They're going to engage in genetic modification, uh, for example. So GMOs are not a a new thing. This is something that agricultural science is about. It's going to investigate and test fertilizing techniques and all sorts of other stuff to turn turn agriculture into an economy of scale uh, as well. But in addition to agricultural sciences, These land-grant colleges will have engineering components, they'll have mining components, mechanical components, so that people can flourish in an industrial revolution, in a type of setting that Alexander Hamilton dreamed of all the way back in the 1790s when he wrote the report on manufacturers in the United States. And this is another major component to these land-grant colleges, all of them needed to have what was called a military science component. Now, the thought behind the military science component was is that these every, every time the United States has these wars crop up, what they always run into is a lack of, of, of skilled officers, officers who can come in, they're ready to go, they know how, to cre- how tactics work, They know how to dream up grand strategies, and more importantly, they know how to implement processes to carry out those tactics and strategies. Since that's always lacking, the thought is, as long as these people are in college and learning all of this other stuff, let's create a reserve officer camp. 
that trains these guys so that in a national emergency, they've already got the training. It's just a matter of bringing them in, having them take maybe a refresher or two, and then they're ready to go right out of the gate instead of us having to wait to catch up with all of this. So every single state winds up creating an agricultural and mechanical or agriculture and military science or an A&M school. Every single state gets one of these. And they're called land-grant colleges because the state takes the land and sets up the college and says, this is a college that will be run by the state okay, to foster all of this other stuff. So while obviously here in Texas, when Texas becomes reconstructed, there's a Texas A&M, every other state in the union also winds up having these land-grant colleges as a way of creating this type of institution to allow people to function in a modern economy. We also see a major change in banking. With the South out of the United States Congress, the uh, the Congress can once again start talking about re-chartering re, uh, a bank of the United States. Now, Andrew Jackson had gotten rid of it back in the 1830s, and the nation's economy rested on private banking. And those private banks issued all sorts of currencies. They issued uh, all sorts of uh, different types of notes, and it was really chaotic. So this new system establishes a single national bank and states that there will be a single national currency under the Treasury Department's auspices. Those private banks will no longer be able to issue currency that is regulated by the national government. Now, this is a boom for those private banks, because remember, those private banks didn't like this system any more than consumers did. Now, people still wanted access to their money without having to walk around and withdraw a bag of gold or something like that. So what banks did, instead of issuing bank drafts, or excuse me, bank notes in the form of paper currency, they started offering people what were called bank drafts. So these bank drafts are the modern equivalent of, or these are the 1860s versions of checking accounts. They evolve into modern checking accounts. So the bank, the state, these individual private banks are going to lose the ability to issue currency, but they will also gain the ability to allow people to access their funds through these drafts. Also, Congress institutes a high protective tariff, something that will protect American manufacturing by keeping foreign manufactured goods out. If you remember all the way back to lecture seven or eight, I think it is, might even be lecture nine. Part of Hamilton's financial plan was to have a high protective tariff, and he couldn't get one. Now, again, the people who would have opposed this tariff, they're out of the union. So Northerners, the union, creates this high protective tariff, okay, forcing essentially all Americans to buy American goods. And how does the government pay for all of this stuff? How do we fund a Bank of the United States? How do we fund this massive internal improvement project like the uh, Transcontinental Railroad? How do we fund purchases of land under the Homestead Act? Simple. During the Civil War, Congress imposed the first new taxes created by the federal government. First, an income tax, which was at the time, a temporary measure, it became a, uh, it, after the Civil War was over, the income tax went away. But Congress also implements an inheritance tax during this period, not as a way of stopping the accumulation of generational wealth, but saying if you are going to pass down wealth, you are going to have to pay a penalty so that all of society can benefit from this largesse that you've accumulated. So the Civil War is about the future of slavery, but it's also about what kind of a country the United States would be, an industrial nation that would take an active role in ensuring that, that society by training engineers, making certain that industry was protected and had very little competition. In short, it's everything Alexander Hamilton would have wanted. Now, the last thing we're going to do with the Civil War itself is talk about contingency. 
what contingency means is that basically nothing in history is predetermined. We've talked a lot about predestination uh, in this class. Uh, history itself is not predetermined. Things frequently happen by chance, by accident, by human agency, the actions of people. These things change timing. They change trends. They uh, change everything. Now, as I mentioned at the start, the North has huge advantages in terms of manpower, in terms of economic resources and material, but this did not make a Union victory inevitable. The Confederacy absolutely could have won the war. On three separate occasions, victory was within the grasp of the Confederacy. Robert E. Lee invaded the North on two separate occasions, and if, even, if one had been even remotely successful, the war would have been over right there. Northerners would have demanded an end to the war. Now, why? Very simply, Europeans depended on slave-grown cotton. And over the course of the war, hundreds of thousands of European laborers lost their jobs in the course of, uh, of all of this. And they begged their governments to intervene in the Civil War on the side of the Confederacy. Now, this was very likely never a real option. Okay, uh, Lincoln did all of these sorts of things like the Emancipation Proclamation uh, that made the war absolutely about slavery, which meant that Europeans who had already banned slavery and banned the slave trade would have found it very hard to explain to their, their people, even as much as they wanted to, would have been very hard to intervene in a war on the side of the slaveholders. Okay, so Lincoln is going to be a key figure here. Okay, and the first and part of this first area of contingency, presidential leadership is a huge issue. Jefferson Davis, the Confederacy's president, had been a congressman, he'd been a senator, he'd fought in the war with Mexico. He had been arguably the single best Secretary of War the United States had during the 19th century. He was a very experienced politician, while Lincoln, on the other hand, had worked most of his life in a two-man law office. His only war experience, wartime experience, was in a war called Black Hawk's War in Illinois, where even he said that his own his only combat experience was in, quote, fighting mosquitoes and wild onion patches. His entire political experience could be summed up in that one disastrous term as a congressman during the war with Mexico. So most people looked at him and said, yeah, he's going to run for president, but he's going to be a disaster. And yet, as presidents of their respective nations, Davis was a failure, and Lincoln is generally considered to be the best. Lincoln had leadership capabilities that no one actually expected. Lincoln had a way of articulating the aims of the war. Uh, and Lincoln was wily. And by doing things like creating the Emancipation Proclamation, by treating the South instead of uh, as a uh, an insurrectionist part of this country, by treating it as a foreign nation on, on several occasions, Lincoln was able to keep the European countries out of this conflict, which is a huge victory for him. Also, Lincoln was not afraid to make changes or to lose men. Over the course of the Civil War, Lincoln had eight separate commanding generals at the head of the United States Armed Forces. And what he needed, what he came to realize was, is he needed a, an officer who was not afraid to act and was not afraid to lose men. That was a big problem that he had with George McClellan, the guy I mentioned in the last lecture. Ulysses S. Grant had one battle where he lost 12,000 men in eight minutes of fighting. But Lincoln didn't care. Lincoln didn't worry about that. Lincoln said, We've always, we will always have more men than they have to put out in the field. So even if it looks bad, we can always beat them man for man. This was a key advantage, and Lincoln knew how to take 
advantage of it. So he didn't panic over these high casualties. A second area of contingency <clears throat> is one that's going to sound a little bit odd at first glance. And this issue is generalship. If Robert E. Lee had been a worse general, slavery probably would have survived and the Confederacy would not have been, quote, beaten the way they were. Robert E. Lee was simply too good. Lee had significant disadvantages uh, at, uh, at the outset of this war. He had far more, dis he had about as many disadvantages, I'm not going to play that card. He had about as many disadvantages as George Washington did when George Washington was the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. But Lee was so masterful at tactics that he was able to prolong the war for four years, which was longer than anybody believed that this could actually happen. Had Lee been lesser, had he lost after a year, a compromised solution, a negotiated settlement, probably would have happened. Remember, the Emancipation Proclamation comes at the end of 1862. Okay, So if Lee had lost anywhere in 1861 and early 1862, this would have changed the course of the war. But the thing is, is that the longer the war went, the more the demands escalated. And this functioned to the Confederacy's detriment. The next area of contingency is morale and public opinion. The way you win a war, and this is part of that total war idea, the way you win a war is not just by defeating the army. Rather, you win a war when you shatter an enemy's morale. Now, we know this uh, in the modern world from fights like the First War in the Persian Gulf, World War II examples of the people in Germany and Japan. When the war, when the will to fight is over, the war itself is over. At the end of the Civil War, to give you an idea of how this played out, Robert E. Lee still had a large army. It was still very well armed. It was well equipped with the exception of food. It was one that was still a fairly useful fighting force. But what was different in April of 1865 about the Confederacy was that the Union Army had instilled defeatism throughout the Confederate home front. People were simply no longer willing to put up with this. And then the last area, we're going to delve into it a little bit more, uh, this idea of foreign intervention. If it had ever happened, it was very, very unlikely, as I've stated. However, there's a fairly good chance that the British Navy would have been at least equal to the task against the United States Navy. Some historians have argued there's no question that the uh, British Navy would have beaten the United States' Navy. But uh, if you ever get a chance to take uh, a military history class, any military historian worth their salt will tell you that the U.S.'s Navy was the by far the most advanced Navy in the world during the Civil War era, uh, courtesy of the innovations they created, uh, the weapons power that they created. Th this was a top-notch Navy. Uh, foreign nations uh, could have challenged the United States' blockade of the South, but if they're not in the war, none of this is a part of the discussion. So Lincoln keeping those foreign nations out of this conflict was a huge win for the Union side. Now, those are all four elements of contingency that virtually any historian could talk about at length. But there's one other area of contingency that we need to talk about, and that is the election of 1864. The election of 1864 loomed large in Lincoln's mind. Lincoln was very worried about this election coming up. By the by 1864, the Union had obviously defeated forces of the Confederacy at places like Gettysburg. They did that in 1863. But they followed that up by losing control of the Mississippi River at a battle called the Battle of Vicksburg. And while guys like Ulysses S. Grant were 
begging Lincoln to take the handcuffs off and let him just do whatever he needed, the Confederacy settled on a new strategy of their own, and it was called attrition. A-T-T-R-I-T-I-O-N. The idea behind attrition is that the South was going to wage a defensive war. They're going to wait for the enemy to attack. They would strike back quickly, but only when they had an advantage, and they would move on. And they would never, ever engage in a pitched battle for a long period of time, because that meant casualty loss. So they've got to avoid major defeats. Their thought here, the South believed, That at some point, they would inflict so many casualties on the North that Northerners would say, cost is too great. Now, we've seen this happen, again, in modern warfare. This was North Vietnam's strategy during the bulk of the Vietnam War. And it worked. They they never engaged in pitched battles. Uh, They very infrequently did that. I shouldn't say literally never. But they very rarely engaged in pitched battles. They used hit-and-run tactics, they attacked only when they knew they had a clear advantage, and they inflicted so many casualties on American forces that ultimately Americans at home said, enough is enough, get us out of there. The South has the same mindset during this period, that the Northerners will ultimately come to a conclusion that too, that this is too much. So what the North, or excuse me, what the South truly believed, what the Confederacy truly believed, If we can hold out until the election of 1864, we'll win. Because Lincoln will, if we've held out until 1864, Lincoln will lose. A new president will come in. They will go to the negotiating table. And the South, the Confederacy, will have everything they wanted. Now, it's not just the South that thinks that this is a possibility. By by August of 1864, before the election, right before it, Lincoln was absolutely despondent. I mean, look at the guy on the screen here. One picture is Lincoln in 1860. The other one is Lincoln right after his election in 1864. This is what four years of war did to this guy. So Lincoln is despondent. He's convinced. He's going to lose. And he was also convinced he started to have some momentary doubts about Ulysses S. Grant. Grant had won a couple of major battles over the Confederacy, but in the process, he lost 65,000 men. And the press turned on Lincoln, said that he had totally screwed up the situation. A New York newspaper, for example, uh, wrote in an editorial about Lincoln, said, quote, patriotism is all played out. All are tired of this abominable tragedy. Even the Republican Party's greatest newspaper supporter, a guy named Horace Greeley, wrote in the New York Tribune, quote, the country is tired and bleeding and longing for peace. And Lincoln just kind of threw up his hands and said, well, that's it. I've lost it. It's over. I'm going to be replaced, and it's over. But at this same moment, William Tecumseh Sherman attacked Atlanta, Georgia. This was a major railroad terminus in the South, and they capture Atlanta, Georgia. And by opening up this terminus and allowing a path upward toward Washington, D.C., this allowed all of the soldiers that were in the Union Army to send in their absentee ballots. See, these aren't the first time these things have been discussed. They're able to send in their absentee ballots. They're able to get to New to Uh, the election centers on time. Also, the news of Sherman's victories winds up turning public opinion, and Lincoln wins. Lincoln wins the election in 1864. Now, it was incredibly hard fought. Okay, And Lincoln, again, you can see in the picture, he he has been through hell and back. So he's looking forward to 1865, thinking, finally, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. There will be peace. We can all take a breath. That's That's not how it plays out. The Confederacy was not done yet. The 
The Confederacy had one last thing that they could do. They had also undergone a radical transformation during the Civil War. Their goal at the start of the war was, as I pointed out to you, through those documents of secession, through the cornerstone speech, their plan is to protect and defend slavery. But by 1865, they've got a whole new goal. Their manpower had been tapped out. Every single white man that could be that could be mobilized had been mobilized. And the South began to do the unthinkable. On March 13th, 1865, the Confederate Congress, with the backing of President Jefferson Davis and, more importantly, the endorsement of General Robert E. Lee, authorized the recruitment of 300,000 enslaved people to serve in the Confederate Army. And more importantly, it guaranteed this resolution by the Confederate Congress guaranteed that these slaves would be granted freedom following the war in return for their service. Why? The goal had changed. The war had altered the Confederacy. While it was about protecting and defending slavery, by 1865, it's independence from the United States. That's why they're willing to sacrifice slavery to get it. But even while he voted for it, a former Southern general named Hal Cobb said the following in the debates, quote, The day you make soldiers of them, of these enslaved peoples, the day you make soldiers of them is the beginning of the end of our revolution. If slaves will make good soldiers, meaning if they have courage, if they can think on their own, if they can be resourceful, the day you make soldiers of them is the end of our revolution. If slaves will make good soldiers, our whole theory of slavery is wrong. Cobb was right. Cobb was absolutely right. But it also becomes a moot point because on April 9th, 1865, less, far less than a month after this, the Confederacy surrendered at Appomattox and the Civil War was officially over. Now, the Civil War is the centerpiece of American history, especially it's the, it's the radicalizing thing of the second half of American history. It produces a revolution in the United States. It produces, uh, it frees between three and four million enslaved people. Some historians are now arguing uh, that the census demonstrated it was four million and it was probably undercounted, so it might actually be four and a half million. But we'll just go with the conservative estimate, three to four million people. The Civil War also, in addition to killing 620,000 people total, look at the South alone. It killed one-fourth of the adult white male population in the South. It will ultimately lead to former slaves achieving political and civil rights. Now, we're not going to overplay this. These political and civil rights are rights that are on the books, so to speak. That doesn't mean that people are going to uh, live up to them or enforce them properly. Uh, that is a topic for History 1302, but at least in terms of what's on the books, the former slaves have uh, achieved political and civil rights. Uh, it also will ultimately lead to the military occupation of the South, with virtually every uh, regional governor being a northerner. Now, the end of the Civil War means the beginning of a new chapter in American history, the period of Reconstruction. And the central issue for the period of Reconstruction, the 12 years after the Civil War, is what will be the status of the former slaves, the so-called freedmen, as they like to be called. The newly freed immediately, as I mentioned when we talked about this in, uh, in the last lecture, they had no real change in status other than they're not 
slaves anymore, but that doesn't mean that they're citizens either. So who knows what the status of these freedmen is. Now, at first, it appeared that there would be no real difference. The war was over, and what every single southern state did immediately was pass a series of laws called Black Codes. Now, they varied from place to place. Uh, they uh, There was certainly no uh, unanimity. There was no continuity in terms of enforcement of these types of laws. So these laws variously required things like written proof of employment or else a person could, uh, a freedman could be jailed for vagrancy. Uh, it called on, these laws frequently called on African Americans to sign employment contracts with their former owners that required them to work from sun up to sun down. Most areas made it a crime for African Americans to leave plantations, to own a weapon. Uh, many, virtually all places barred freedmen from owning property. And one former slave summed it up very well uh, about how they felt about these black codes. He said, quote, if you call this freedom, what did you call slavery? This wasn't any real change in status as people like him saw it. Now, a number of Northerners also saw what was happening. They saw these codes and they said, why did we fight? Why did we do all of this? Why did 620,000 people have to die if this is the end result? So they began demanding a new, a new set of laws. They said Reconstruction has to be different. It has to be punishment of the South. So there's a real change here. Now, a crucial blow to Reconstruction was struck almost immediately after the Civil War. The Civil War ends officially again on April 9th, 1865. But on April 15th, 1865, Abraham Lincoln, who had been assassinated the night before, uh, died. And with his death, his own plan for Reconstruction also died. Now, Lincoln's plan was called the 10% Plan, meaning that if 10% of the 1860 voters swore an allegiance to the United States and took an took their oath of allegiance and their state wrote a new constitution that specifically abolished slavery Lincoln would consider them quote reconstructed and thus readmitted now 10% doesn't sound like much it's not 90% of the voters could say no I don't agree to this and they'd still be brought in the reason for this is, is Lincoln had said in his second inaugural address that we must pursue reunification, and he said, with malice toward none and with charity for all. So it was going to be, by design, a very easy process. But uh, Congress didn't like this. Congress said, no, we got to punish these Confederates. And Congress offered, sorry, let me go back one. Congress offered something else. It was a bill called the Wade Davis Bill. And I don't have the name up here because fundamentally what's different between the Wade Davis bill and Lincoln's 10% plan is that Congress with Wade Davis wanted 50% of the voters to swear this allegiance and also uh, pass the state, uh, a new state constitution that abolishes slavery. Uh, so Congress proposes this as a counter to Lincoln's 10% plan. Uh, and ultimately, uh, Lincoln decided to let it die. Uh, he engaged in what's called a pocket veto, meaning he refused to sign the bill or veto the bill uh, while Congress was in session. And the congressional session expired, so the bill itself dies uh, by rule. So Lincoln engages in a pocket veto, but before Congress can, re, uh, can revisit the issue, Lincoln gets assassinated. So the new president is Andrew Johnson. Now, Andrew Johnson was a Democrat. Lincoln had put Johnson uh, on the ticket as a way to demonstrate union. He said, what better way to demonstrate that we're all one nation and that we're reuniting as a nation than to say, I'm a Republican and I'm naming a Democrat as my running mate. Now, Johnson was a different type of guy. Johnson is coming up. In the, in the party, he does, in fact, favor unionism. As governor of Tennessee, he opposed all efforts to secede. But aside from that, he's not much different 
than every other Southerner who preceded him in the White House or in a number of his uh, uh, governor's chairs. Johnson was illiterate into adulthood. He absolutely detested the wealthy and he detested large slaveholders. So Republicans were a little bit optimistic about Johnson. But Johnson also was deeply racist and he was prone to flattery. So Southern elites knew exactly how to ingratiate themselves with Johnson and to get everything that they wanted. And the first battle that breaks out when Johnson comes into office, uh, the first battle over Reconstruction, uh, is between Congress and what to do with this guy who's just become president. Who's going to run Reconstruction? Will it be Congress or the president? Now, the first blow is the creation of something called the Freedmen's Bureau, the first national government effort, the first federal effort at any sort of social welfare program. The Bureau, the Freedmen's Bureau, as it was called, would provide food, shelter. It would create schools. Uh, because it's implemented at the state level, it also can function as an information clearinghouse for families that had been torn apart by slavery. They could put their names in at the Freedmen's Bureau level, and these bureaus would exchange information to try to reunite families. The Bureau also handled contract disputes between plantation owners and their former slaves. And what really galled a lot of Southerners was that the Freedmen's Bureau frequently ruled in favor of the laborers, the former slaves, as opposed to the plantation owners. Uh, now, when this bill creating the Freedmen's Bureau gets passed, Johnson initially vetoed it. And the reason he vetoed it was because all of these Southern elites had lobbied him and told him, look, this is a terrible idea. You don't want to do this. And Johnson said, OK, they said it's no good. So vetoed. Congress is allowed to override a veto if they've got two thirds support in both chambers of the Congress, both the House and the Senate. And they did. So they overrode the veto and passed this without Johnson's approval. So this creates a fight between Congress and the president. Now, the Freedmen's Bureau, it's going to get created. It's going to end in 1872, oddly, because Northerners have kind of turned their attention away from things. And they look at the Freedmen's Bureau as having outlived its usefulness. So rather than recertify it or provide future funding for it, they say, eh, let's just let it die. They refuse to, re they refuse to fund it. So it, it just dies. Now, the next area of conflict between the president and Congress comes over the issue of land for the freedmen. Now, some of you may have heard about the myth of 40 acres and a mule and been, been told it was just that. It was a myth that slaves were never given 40 acres and a mule. I know I was told 40 acres and a mule when I was in high school. Then when I got to college, I was told, no, 40 acres and a mule was a myth. The reality lies somewhere in between. Toward the end of the Civil War, William Tecumseh Sherman issued something called Field Order 15. Field Order 15 confiscated about 400,000 acres of land in Georgia and South Carolina uh, and the northern parts of Florida. And shame on me for not putting it on this slide, but it's Field Order 15. So Sherman confiscates these 400,000 acres of land. Other generals started following suit. And the reason they're confiscating them is because Southerners, seeing these armies coming in and knowing the reputation of these armies, armies said, oh, the hell with this, we're out of here. And they left. So Sherman said, fine, we're going to call these abandoned, and we're going to take them over, essentially, by eminent domain. And then what Sherman did through Field Order 15 is he says that the 400,000 acres that had been abandoned are now for the sole use of the freedmen. They will be distributed amongst the freedmen who lived in that area. They will be, they'll not only be in control of the land, they will have political control of that area as well. And then as far as the, the mules part of this, one of the provisions in Field Order 15 was that they could actually uh, lease a team of mules from the government. Now, the idea here, why he's doing this, 
is Sherman is trying to create some sense of economic independence. Now, a lot of historians put this squarely on William Tecumseh Sherman. However, Sherman had actually discussed it with Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War, and Stanton said, yes, this is a good idea. Do it. So this was considered to be okay. Now, this also put Edwin Stanton at odds with Andrew Johnson. And ultimately, Andrew Johnson wound up issuing an executive order stating that this violated the Constitution, this confiscation of land and redistribution of land violated the Constitution. So his executive order reversed all of this, ordering the army to evict the freedmen and return the property to its, quote, rightful owners. So Congress sees this. They're angry. Edwin Stanton also is furious about this. He believes as Secretary of War, his orders should have been followed, and Johnson should have accepted that Stanton knows what he's doing. Keep that in mind because it's going to become important in a couple of minutes. The last area is violence, violence against African Americans, and particularly in places like Texas, which were a little bit more remote. Uh, some of you may know that uh, there's a holiday in June called Juneteenth, June 19th, which is the official ending of slavery because that's when uh, Union Army forces actually landed in Galveston, Texas, and proclaimed, A, the Civil War was over, but also proclaimed that all slaves are, quote, forever free. Well, a lot of Texans didn't accept this and kept their enslaved uh, under their control. Uh, in places like Brazoria County, for example, Slaveholders did things like change the, chain their enslaved people to trees so that they couldn't just go, well, screw it. The law says we're free. We're leaving. Uh, they were chained to trees so they couldn't leave. And a lot of slaveholders simply took the position that, well, rather than free these people, I'd rather kill them. So there were 3,000 freedmen killed in Texas. And Johnson's position on this was this is a matter for local law enforcement. This is an issue for the Texas state government to handle, and I'm not going to get involved in it. And he specifically tells the soldiers who had landed in Galveston that you are to stay out of this. This has nothing to do with you guys. So everybody's angry. Congress is furious now. And they say, we're not taking this anymore. And in 1866, during the so-called midterm elections, Congress Congress, a group of people called the Radicals, get swept into office. Now, they're not terribly radical. What marks them as radical is that they believe that they should be in charge of the process of Reconstruction, not the president. So what they do, once they're now in power... And they've got control of two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate. So they've got veto-proof majorities. What they do first is they inaugurate radical reconstruction by dividing the South into five military districts. Now, each state will have a governor. And most of those governors, it's worth pointing out, were what were called carpetbaggers, northerners who came down to the South to take advantage of the situation, or people who were called scalawags, meaning they were Southerners, but for political expediency, sided with the Republicans. So they were all basically people who sided with Republicans anyway. And then those state governors reported to a military governor at the district level. And all five of those military governors were Union Army generals. Now, that's bad. This is what's called martial law. This is bayonet rule. And Southerners hated this. They hated the dividing up into military districts with a passion. Now, they also, as part of this deal, those military governors are allowed at their discretion to use military forces to enforce the law. So this makes a lot of Southerners really, really upset. Next. Congress passes two new constitutional amendments. Now, one, they, they, they passed a 13th Amendment almost immediately after the Civil War was over. That 13th Amendment ended slavery. 
But as I mentioned, the 13th Amendment ending slavery did only that. It didn't deal with the status of the new freedmen. So the 14th and 15th Amendment are going to deal with both of these things. They're going to uh, deal. It was it was absolutely necessary to deal with these uh, these issues. The 14th Amendment dealt with citizenship at first. Dealt with citizenship, and it's a callback to the Dred Scott case. If you remember the Dred Scott case, uh, Roger Taney said that the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, etc., do not apply to black people in the United States, that they are not citizens, and therefore they're not entitled to any of the protections of these laws. So the 14th Amendment first says we're going to establish a very simple threshold for citizenship. If you're born in the United States, you're a citizenship, period. You're a citizen, excuse me. And it also has something called the Equal Protection Clause that says the rights of citizenship apply equally to all citizens. Now, there's an unintended consequence of this. And this and it's and this is what it is. If you remember all the way back to the beginning of the semester, or when we got to the Constitution, the three fifths compromise gave Southerners a ton of of political control because they were able to count three fifths of the enslaved toward population. Well, that advantage went away, but they get reinvigorated here because once the 14th amendment is passed and these people are literally no longer slaves, this means the three fifths compromise no longer applies. Southerners don't count African Americans three-fifths of the total toward population, they can now count 100% toward the total. Now, there's still a need for another amendment because even though the 14th Amendment says the rights of citizenship apply equally to all, there was still a sense that we need to do something specifically to state that the freedmen can vote. Because this doesn't specifically say freedmen can vote. So theoretically, a strict constructionist could go, well, no, you, they, they can't vote. So Congress also, this radical Congress also, passes the 15th Amendment, which states that the right to vote cannot be denied on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Now, believe it or not, th their intention here is to basically say everybody gets the right. If you're a citizen, you have the right to vote. But there's a big loophole in here. For example, a strict constructionist could read this and say, okay, you can't deny the right to vote on the basis of race color, or previous condition of servitude. So as long as we don't use race, color, or previous condition of servitude, we can still discriminate, right? And sadly, the courts go, yes, that's what it says. We know what you're trying to do here, but we can't stop you because, yeah, this is what the law actually says. So this sets up a conflict, a civil rights conflict, for your 1302 classes when you all take 1302. So Reconstruction is proceeding, and Johnson is growing ever more angry over all of this stuff, specifically because he basically has no power. Whatever he does, if Congress passes a law and he vetoes it, they can, go, they can override it. So Congress is sitting there saying, we're really going to stick it to Johnson. Johnson hated... Edwin Stanton. Edwin Stanton was the Secretary of War. I mentioned him a few minutes ago. He hated Edwin Stanton, and he asked Stanton for his resignation, partially because of all the stuff that Stanton had done with the Freedmen's Bureau and Field Order 15, but also because Stanton was a, quote, radical Republican and had helped orchestrate the victory of the radicals. So Johnson says, I want your resignation. And Stanton tells him, no, I'm not going to resign. Johnson starts threatening to follow, to fire him. So, 
Congress moves very quickly to stop this. Congress passes in 1867 something called the Tenure of Office Act. Now, what the Tenure of Office Act did is it required the president to get congressional approval to remove any appointee who has been confirmed by the Congress. So a Secretary of War, a Secretary of the Treasury, a Secretary of you know, pick whatever cabinet. If the Senate confirmed this person, it requires Senate confirmation to remove this person as well. And Johnson says, well, I don't care. I'm going to test this anyway. And he fires Edwin Stanton. He says, if he's not going to resign, I'm going to fire him. Now, Congress takes the position that by firing Stanton, Andrew Johnson, the President of the United States, has violated the law. He has committed a crime. So for the first time in American history, we have an impeachment of a president. And Andrew Johnson is impeached in the House of Representatives. He is impeached overwhelmingly. They vote overwhelmingly to send a case to the Senate. However, the Senate looked at this and said, we don't like Andrew Johnson, but we don't want to set the precedent that you can remove presidents like this. And they started debating all of this, and they're on the verge of removing him. But at the last minute, one senator switched his vote, and Johnson winds up staying in. The Republicans fail to reach the two-thirds threshold by one vote. Now, certainly, more congressmen, more senators favored removing Johnson than keeping Johnson. But the rules of the Constitution require a two-thirds majority, and they failed to get the two-thirds majority by one vote. So it's literally one senator who keeps Johnson in power. But Johnson figured out what was going on here. Johnson realizes that, you know, I better just be quiet and keep my mouth shut for the rest of my presidency and not rock the boat. In 1868, Johnson does not even bother to announce a candidacy for re-election. Uh, the Democrats make it clear we're not planning to nominate you anyway. Um, and the reason for that is very simple. In 1868, Ulysses S. Grant has made it clear that he'd like to be president. He's basically been drafted by the Republican Party. And Ulysses S. Grant is one of the most popular people in American society. So everybody looks at this and goes, ah, don't even bother running against him because Grant's going to win. So Johnson fades away. But actually, so does Reconstruction. Reconstruction fades away with him. By 1872, most of the abolitionist agenda had been achieved, and they just didn't have it in them anymore to fight with the South over these issues. The South started in 1872 electing overtly racist representatives and governors and began repressing civil rights. And people in Congress just looked at it and said, we've got other things to do. We won the war. We've established new constitutional amendments. We've established civil rights. We've done all of this stuff. Plus, we've got a whole West to worry about. We've got to deal with what's going on with the Indians in the West and how to protect all of those people who homesteaded out there. So while the South is doing all of this stuff and imposing new labor systems like sharecropping and crop liens, People in Congress are going, yeah, we, we just don't have the energy or the resources to fight this and fight what's going on in the West. And they simply concluded the West is more important at the moment. So the Republican Party essentially abandons African Americans in the South to the designs of people in the people at home, people in the South. And the sort of fallout, we see this in 1876. What really ends Reconstruction begins with the election of 1876. Rutherford B. Hayes is a Republican candidate. He's from Ohio. And the Democrats' candidate is Samuel Tilden from New York. Both of them run. They both have a fair, fairly big following. What Mark Tilden as different as a Democrat is that he's not a Southern Democrat. But he made it pretty clear that he believes in states' rights and keeping the federal government out of people's lives. So he's pretty clear 
that he's going to uh, that he's going to winnow down Reconstruction. Now, when the election of 1876 actually happens, Tilden wins the popular vote and he wins a majority in the Electoral College. However, the Republicans disputed the results in four different states. And those four states represented enough electoral votes that if those four states went to Hayes instead of Tilden, then Tilden, then Hayes would have the necessary majority. Now, the Constitution provides for what happens if there's no winner. But there is no provision for what happens if one of the winners disputes the election. So what Congress did was they created a committee, a committee to investigate the presidential election, because their thought was, well, if we'd handle the election if there was no winner, we'd handle the election if one of them disputed it. So the Congressional Committee gets created. It draws from it draws five people from the House, five people from the Senate, five people from the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court is going to be the important part of this because the Supreme Court does not have a majority of Democrats or Republicans. It's equal. It's split amongst Republicans. And there is uh, Republicans and Democrats equally. There's four and four. And there's one independent. So when their five are chosen from the Supreme Court, they choose two Democrats, two Republicans, and the one independent to make sure that there isn't a strict party line split here. Now, the Democrats thought that they could win over this Supreme Court justice by promising him uh, the election as a senator from Illinois. He was from Illinois. The state legislature determines who the senators are. So the Democratic Party said, look, just do what we want or, you know, just come with us, be a Democrat, and we'll make you the senator from Illinois. So he accepts. He says, fine, I'll take the Senate position. But then he also says, but in good conscience, I cannot stay on this committee anymore. I have to remove, remove myself. And Congress decided to put a Republican on the committee in his place. And as most people figured it would, this congressional committee voted eight to seven with their Republican majority to give all of those disputed states and thus all of their disputed electoral votes to Rutherford B. Hayes. And Rutherford B. Hayes, quote, wins the presidency. But Democrats are furious and Democrats say, absolutely not. We're not going to accept this. And the Electoral College is forbidden from meeting. They cannot announce that we have met, we have cast our ballots, and here's who the new president is. Add to this, several states are talking about mobilizing their militias. Massachusetts and Virginia actually do put their militias on emergency standby, saying we may have to go back to fighting the Civil War. But finally, in January of 1877, they reach one last compromise. And it's kind of fitting that we're going to end our semester on a compromise. This is the Compromise of 1877. Both sides agreed this is not good for the country to have this fight and have this potential going, this potential backwards step. So the committee gets together, this committee of Republicans and Democrats gets together and says, Let's appoint Rutherford B. Hayes as the president. And Republicans say to Democrats, what do you want? Tell us what you want to support this. And the Democrats say, fine. Hayes has to appoint a Democrat to his cabinet, which Hayes does. He has to support federal aid for railroad construction in the South, which means rebuilding all the railroads that were torn up and supporting a Southern version of the Transcontinental Railroad. And then the most important provision is that Hayes must agree to remove all of those federal troops, eliminate the political, or those military districts, and get those troops out of the South. Now, those troops, for the most part, had been enforcing the rights of the freedmen. And Southerners are going, you want our support? 
get him out. And Hayes agrees to do this. So Hayes does win the presidency. The Republicans do hold on to the presidency, but they have to give in to these major demands of the Democratic Party. So essentially what happens, the fallout from all of this is, is that the South is going to be left to its own devices when it comes to handling racial issues. The North is not going to interfere with this. And there's sort of a tacit um, agreement that the North is going to be able to handle the economy. They're going to dominate the economy. They're going to do whatever they need to do. And Southerners will stay out of that. They'll say, yeah, whatever you need, you do what you need to do. We're going to do what we need to do with racial issues. So there's a trade-off here. And the real trade-off, the real group that's going to be left in the middle of this is the African Americans in the South who had supported the Republican Party, who had counted on the Republican Party, and who now have been left hamstrung by the Republican Party. Now, for the fallout from all of this, to see how the Compromise of 1877 plays out, unfortunately, you're not going to hear it from me because this is the last thing we've got. You're going to have to go and take History 1302 for that fallout. This is the last thing I have to say here. Um, this ends Lecture 19. It also ends Module 3. It means you're ready to take the final exam. So good luck on the final exam. Good luck with the rest of the semester. Good luck in your other classes. And good luck in the rest of your lives. Thank you.